We'll praise the Lord. Have you had a good week? Amen. I tell you what, I was in prayer today, and uh, you know the Lord. Uh, it's been beautiful weather. Uh, of course, we got a little bit of rain yesterday, and uh, how much we needed that. And uh, but spring is here, the spring fever, and so I get antsy to start working in the yard. And I got to cut some of the yard uh, yesterday and do some things like that after uh, being up here at the church. But uh, what a blessing! I've been thinking about you, praying for you. Pray that you've had a good week. And I've been praying about the lesson tonight. I'm excited, so we're going to jump right in. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 17. Amen. We're going to start there. If I can get there. Here we go. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 17. All right. We've been studying on Wednesday nights, the Back to the Basics is what I've kind of entitled it, Back to the Basics, just a refresher. Uh, everybody needs to be reminded from time to time just the basics of the Christian life to remind us uh, what we stand on and things like that. We started out with salvation, just reminding us about that we're saved, we're born again. Praise the Lord and hallelujah for that, amen, born again on our way to heaven. And uh, just a reminder for that. Uh, and then we talked about baptism, and we talked a little bit about that. We talked about, some, uh, about the local church and how important it is to be in the house of God and how important the house of God is for every believer. Uh, and then, uh, I forgot what we talked. Well, no, we, it was right, we had Brother Locklear last week. And so now this week, uh, the next, uh, another next to the basics in the Christian life is this, uh, is this doctrine of separation. Uh, every Christian has to come in a point in time where when, they, when you're saved, you're born again, you get into church, you begin to grow. A natural reaction uh, at being a Christian is you begin to separate from the world. You begin to be different. Uh, you begin to not desire the old things. And sometimes maybe you still do those old things, but you begin to have that desire to separate. And so this is another uh, basic of the Christian life. Paul talks about it uh, with the Corinthians and how that there was problems in the Corinthian church. And, you know, I, I have to say, reading the book of First and Second Corinthians, I'm very thankful I didn't pastor a church like that. Amen. <laughs> they had some difficulties. Amen. I'm thankful for you. And reading that made me more thankful for the people that you are because, man, Paul, <laughs> he tore them up. You read that, and they had some problems. Amen. But he still dealt with the idea of separation, and he let them know. He said, as a Christian, you, there's a natural separation that begins to occur. And so we're going to kind of go over some principles and things like that as we get into the message. Uh, but we're going to read verse 17 real quick. I'm just going to read this real quick out loud. The Bible says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Amen. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do love you. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful day that you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for the beautiful weather, Lord, the rain that we received, and how much, Lord, that was needed. And thank you, Lord, for the blessing, Lord, of as I was reminded, Lord, reading in, in my Bible reading, that after the rain, Lord, you put the rainbow in the sky, and that you promised again to Noah and about not flooding the earth, and how that, Lord, you've kept your promises all these years. And, Lord, even today, Lord, you've kept those promises. And it reminded me, God, how good that you are, and how that you keep the rest of uh, your promises that you've given to us as Christians that we can hold to today and claim because of how good that you are. Thank you, Lord, so much for that. Thank you, Lord, for everybody being here in the house of God tonight. May we grow a little more. May we enjoy. May we have a good time learning from the Word of God. And may you just please, Holy Spirit, speak and use me in a special and a mighty way. We love you. We thank you. Ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I touched a little bit on it on Sunday night when we were talking about when Jesus prayed for us and the different things that when Jesus prayed for us, he naturally prayed that we would be kept from the evil and we would be sanctified. And so separation is essentially the same thing. It's that sanctification process that a Christian begins to go, to, go through. Now the thing is with separation, because we are sinners, we're never, uh, this is an ongoing process. Sanctification is not a process that you start and then finish. It's, it's ongoing. All the rest of your life until you meet the Lord and Jesus calls us home will never be perfect. And so we'll consistently, constantly be separating from things because the world and the flesh and the devil are constantly throwing things at Christians. The devil's constantly throwing things your way. And so you have to constantly separate from new things and separate from this, and you have to say no to this and say no to that. And so it's an ongoing process. 
This is something that every one of us, even as the pastor and, and your pastor's wife, we even battle on a daily basis, constantly separating and constantly being on guard. But we separate because we want to not allow the devil's influence in our lives. We want to limit the devil's influence. Amen. And then, of course, by separating, we draw closer to the Lord. The blessing of separation is that we draw closer to God in our daily life. In a Christian's life, God has made it clear, as we saw, that we must be separated. He says, And come out from among them, and be ye separate. God wants there to be a clear distinction between the believer and the unbelievers. God says there's, there should be a difference. So we're going to look at a little bit. We're going to go back uh, in verse 14 and through 16. And, there's some, uh, and through these verses, there's some things here I'd like us to look at. When God said to come out from among them, be ye separate, we go back a few verses and see uh, a little bit of what, what took place before. The Bible says, verse 14, God says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And so you see right off the bat, God starts out and says, As a believer, you're saved, you're born again, you're different. You now, God says He doesn't want us to be unequally yoked. And this is just part of that under in your notes. This is just part of that introduction part there. Uh, God doesn't want us to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now that's not saying that we don't go out and go to the world and go shopping and pick up groceries and hand out tracts and invite people to church. That's not what that's talking about. But God is saying that we're not to unequally yoke ourselves together. We're not to get buddy-buddy with the unbelievers and go and, and, and enjoy fellowship that what we should be having with other believers. Uh, a lot of times Christians will uh, allow friends to come and allow friends to begin being an influence in their lives when God says you're supposed to replace that with, the right, with righteousness. We keep looking. He says, and be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together. Don't be... A yoke is something, and I forgot I was going to mention, a yoke is something that you do with oxen. If you're familiar with the Bible and you've studied the Bible or maybe you're just familiar with farming, a yoke is something that you put on oxen uh, you put on an animal and they, that they can work, they can pull something with. In the Bible days, they did that with the oxen and the plows, and the oxen wore the yoke, and they took, took the plow and plowed the ground, and that's how they had to till back then. And so, but they had to have two. They had two oxen, and so one oxen would be in this yoke, and one, the other oxen would be in the other portion of the yoke, and they would pull together to achieve a common purpose. And so God says, as a Christian, we're not to unequally yoke our... We're not to get in the yoke with an unbeliever because we're trying to go one way and they're trying to go the other. And so you're battling and you're never going to get anywhere for the Lord. You're never going to get anything done for God. Why? Because you're unequally yoked, the Bible says. When you get in with an unbeliever and you're trying to go for God and go and go and go, but you've allowed them to get in that yoke with you, then you never achieve what you could do for the Lord. Now, hopefully, amen, we, uh, you know, we try to give them the gospel. We try to get them saved, be a believer with us. But God says, until they've come to that, no, don't get in the yoke with them. Don't allow them to influence and start to drag you backwards instead of forwards. Amen. We're going to see when God says, and then there's a colon there, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, a colon. He's beginning to explain a little bit here. It says, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? So God compares it. What fellowship with, does righteousness have with unrighteousness? God gives kind of a, uh, 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 an idea, kind of a, dis a description uh, with unbelievers and believers. It's, it's like righteousness and unrighteousness. They're two completely different things. Two completely different ideas. One is about righteousness, one is unrighteousness. And God says between those, there's no fellowship. And so for a Christian, our fellowship should be limited with those that are unrighteous because we want to be righteous in how we live and how we act and what we do, and we don't want to do the works of unrighteousness. That doesn't mean that we're not kind, but we want to be careful. And then look there, and what communion hath light with darkness? And so then again, we see another, we have light and we have darkness. God says there's not communion there. There's not a, uh, the word communion uh, is talking about uh, like a, a fellowship between friends. There's an agreement. God says there's no agreement between light and darkness. Light and dark don't mix. It's either one or the other. Amen. And so you want to be a light to this world. Amen. And we don't want to let that dark in. Then the God says there another, uh, another illustration. And what 
uh, concord hath Christ with Belial. Notice there again, this is all just under that introduction real quick. God says the different, we shouldn't be unequally yoked because there's no concord, there's no agreement that Christ has with the devil. Belial there is talking about the devil. So God says there's no agreement between Christ and the devil. Sometimes when you yoke with an unbeliever, you're a child of God, they're a child of the devil. And so you have two completely different desires. This is why we're to be careful as Christians uh, who we allow to be friends, who we allow to be uh, in our homes, because there's no agreement with Jesus and the devil. There's, not, there's never going to be agreement. That's why it's be careful who we marry, because if, you, if you're not careful and you marry somebody that's not born again, then what happens is, is your father's God, their father's the devil, you've got in-law problems. Because you've got two different goals. And so God says, don't unequally yoke yourself. Then we have uh, uh, the next thing there. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? That part there is talking about like when you go and you buy shares. And you, you, you get, you're a stockholder, you buy a share. What part, what share does a believer have with an infidel? When you buy shares with somebody, you begin, you, you now... You now both own a portion. Believers and infidels have no part together. You have no portion that you share. You're going to heaven, they're bound for hell. There's no portion that you have. God's given you the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says they obey as children of disobedience the spirit of disobedience through the devil. And so there's no part, there's no portion that you share. And then the, the, the next one there, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. In the Old Testament, God, we know, used that they had the temple. And in the New Testament, we are the temple. In the Old Testament, the temple of God, there was not allowed idols to be in there. And when they took the ark of God to a temple that had idols, as we know, with uh, uh, um, the, where, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the lady, uh, or the idol that fell and broke in the head. Say again. Dagon, there we go, praise the Lord. I, it escaped me, I had it, I forgot to put that in my notes. Thank you, brother. Uh, but, you know, when, the, temple, when, the, when the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant was taken to a temple of idols, God crushed those idols and, turn, and, and made them understand that He was the only true God. Well, as the New Testament temple, God says there's no agreement with idols. In your life, there's no place, there's no agreement. God has no agreement with idols in your life because God is your God. He lives on the inside, the Holy Spirit, and God says He should have the preeminence as a Christian, and this will make us be separated. That's why He says, wherefore? So because of that, because of who God is, because there's no agreement, because there's no concord, there's no fellowship, there's no communion, there's none of those things, God says, wherefore? Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And so we see, so because of that, we're born again, we're saved. Now because of that, now we should come out from among the world and be separate. Now when we talk about separation from the world, and this is where you can start writing down the points. When we talk about separation from the world, though, what do we mean? The Bible uses the term world in three different manners. When you study your Bible, the term world is used to refer to three different things. Number one, you have the world in John 1.10. And you can just write down the world in John 1.10. This reference is referring to the earth itself. Okay? Uh, uh, in John 1.10, let me turn there for you and read that. I didn't put it into my notes. So let me turn there. Let me get there. John chapter 1. Here we go. Praise the Lord. Okay. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And so we actually see uh, a couple different forms of it, but it talks about he was in the world, and the world was made by him. This is a reference to the earth itself. Uh, when God used, so when we say we're supposed to be separated from the world, do we mean that you're separate from the earth itself? No, we don't all, we're not all going to put on spacesuits and go live in outer space, amen. We're not talking about separate yourself from this physical earth, amen. Uh, doesn't mean that now I'm advocating we all move to Mars. So what we say about separation from the world, we know we're not talking about 
the earth itself. Also another reference for that is 1 Samuel 2.8 that talks about the earth itself uh, and different things like that. That's, uh, in fact, in letter A there, I'm sorry, that's where that will go. Uh, letter, you have the world, and number one, and then letter A, the earth itself. These are the three things that refer to the world in the Bible. And that's 1 Samuel 2.8 for letter A. Number, letter B is the people of the world. In Psalms chapter 9, verse 8, in Psalms chapter 9, verse 8, let me turn there. There's another reference we have of the world, and that says this. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. And so we see here, God's going to judge the world. But is God saying he's just going to judge the earth, the dirt, the soil, the trees, the grass? No. God is going to judge the people of the world. God is going to judge you and I. He's going to judge those. He's going to judge the wicked. He's going to judge the people of the world. And then we have letter C, the agenda. 1 Corinthians 4, 9 refers to this. So you have three different terms for the world found in Scripture. One references the earth itself, one references the people, and then this one represents the agenda of the world. I'll show you what I mean. It says, For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. And then 1 Corinthians 7, verse 31. 7 verse 31 says, And they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. And so you see there's an agenda of the world. There's a fashion of the world. Another verse, uh, and I didn't write it down, I should have, talks about the rudiments of the world. And that's talking about the principles of the world. And so not necessarily referring to the earth itself, not referring to the people, but the, the agenda that is being pushed by the world. And that agenda is controlled by number two, the prince of this world. John chapter 12 verse 31. John chapter 12 verse 31 says this. And I'm leading somewhere, so follow me. It says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The devil is the prince of this world at this time. The devil controls the agenda or the philosophy or the principles that this world pushes. You never notice how that the world is constantly pushing an anti-Christian agenda that comes from the devil himself. Now the people of this world get caught up in that agenda, but they don't realize what's going on, especially if they're lost. And then the earth itself is controlled, the Bible says, is the prince of the power of the air. The devil controls the earth itself bar, uh, with God's permission, but he controls that agenda that, will ulti that ultimately controls the people. Because the agenda, the fashion, the principles, the devil is pushing constantly. To ch and that's why the fashion of the world changes. There's always a new fad. There's a new this. There's a new this. There's a new this. And it's always this anti-Christian agenda. That's what the devil's pushing. And so when we say to separate yourself from the world, what we're talking about, again, is not the earth itself, not to go live in space and be, uh, you know, and live in the uh, Mars or something. We're not to separate from people. In other words, you don't go live in a monastery like monks and, and never have outside contact. Uh, but you're to separate from that agenda, from the philosophy that the world is pushing. You're to separate yourself, your family, from what the devil tries to push on this world. We're going to keep going. So uh, number three is separation from the world. We talked about the world itself, referenced three times, the earth itself, the people, and the agenda. Then the prince of this world controls the agenda, and then we're going to talk about so separation from the world. When we talk about separation, again, we're talking about from that agenda. Uh, let's go real quick. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. The Bible says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So you see where the devil, and I'm glad I, I, this is where I put that verse. The devil is trying to push through philosophy and vain deceit and the tradition of men and the principles of the world. 
You can always count if, the, if, what, if what is being pushed through your television or through the music or all of those things, if it's not after Christ, then it's following the agenda of the world. So as a Christian, you're born again. You got saved. You know you did. You accepted Jesus as your Savior. Praise the Lord. So now we begin to slowly realize that the devil's trying to push an agenda, and we want to stay away from that. We want to separate ourselves to Christ. This is an ongoing process. Now let's real, real quick look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The hard part is to where we need to become prudent. As the book of Proverbs says, we have to become prudent to where we can foresee that evil. We can begin to discern, as Christians, we can begin to discern what is the devil trying to push and what draws us closer to the Lord. If we can figure out, as Christians, if we can figure out what is right and wrong, we can begin to separate from the wrong and separate ourselves to the right and be closer to the Lord. This is also something that not, you know, uh, some people always have uh, different ideas. And there, you know, when it comes to separation, you know, I know some that uh, some people say, well, I don't have a, uh, a TV at all, or some have TVs. And, and, and your, your, your uh, level of separation is up to you. The difference that we have to have is understand where, what separation needs to be done, and then we can begin to, to do that. So, and then there are some things that we are to separate from just completely. I mean, there's some things that we know, just cut that off, just be done, amen. We just know that just comes natural. Like when you're born, it comes natural to eat, <laughs> amen. When you're born again, you're a Christian, some things it should just be. Paul talked about that. There are some things that should just be, and then there are some things that it depends. You have to that it depends on you, what your level of separation, how close to the Lord you want to be, things like that. But we're going to look at Titus chapter 2, verse number 11 through 12. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And so we see God says when Jesus died on the cross and he gave his life for you as a Christian, he wanted to redeem you, but it didn't just want to stop there. He wanted to give you a home in heaven, give you salvation, but now he wants to purify you as a peculiar people. He talked about in the Old Testament, the, uh, the children of Israel were a peculiar people. God want, Because they were his glory, God wanted to make them a peculiar nation. And the reason God judged them so hard was because they were to reference God's glory to this earth and they were constantly going after idols and they were constantly tearing down God's glory by allowing the world to be pushed in and be taken with the world. And so God judged them so hard because God wanted them to be peculiar, to be a light to this world. God judges us because as Christians we're the temple of God and He redeemed us, but He wants to purify us a peculiar people, so that way His glory can be shown. But can I say what a privilege it is to, uh, for us, that God want to show His glory through our lives. But God's glory is shown through separation, through that purification. Your God's power is shown through salvation. God's glory comes when you are a separated Christian for Him. When the world looks at you and sees there's something different. That's when God gets the glory. So, let me see here. Uh, so, and then we see Titus chapter 2. So, God's grace ha that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. The same grace that brought us salvation is the same grace that teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. I hear some, there are some preachers that will preach and you hear them preach sermons that uh, you can get saved, and then that's it. They say you don't, and then you can reach people uh, as you are. You have to be like them to win them, is what they say. But according to this verse, that's not true. 
Because God's grace that brought salvation is the same grace that continues to teach you to deny ungodliness. That's the same grace that continues to teach you to live soberly and righteously and godly. And so it's a false doctrine to say that you get saved and that's all that God wants. Because according to here, God's grace that brought you salvation, now that same grace wants to purify you as a peculiar person. There are some that teach, well, it's, we, uh, we have to, like I said, we have to be like them to win them. Or if we uh, are, are so far from the world that they're not going to want what we have because we're so different. But God says that's not true. The grace that separates you is that grace that preserves salvation. When they see you're different, they want what's different. When the world looks at you and sees that God has purified you and God has made you something that they, they want. And a lot of times churches think, well, we got to be like them to win them. When people are looking for a way out, they don't want to see what they are. They want to see what God can do. Kind of like if you're sick. If you're a... I'll be a sick man. <coughs> you're sick and you come to church and you say... You know, I, I need to get some medicine. I tell you, oh, my doctor's a great guy. <coughs> he can help you. He's helped me, <coughs> and I'm sick. You're not going to want to go to my doctor because you're going to think, well, what's he done for you? <laughs> great doc. I'm going to go find somebody I can get help. The world does the same thing. When the world looks at us, when they get to a point that they want help, they're not going to look to Joe Cool that looks just like him, that's in the same problem, that's in the sin. They're going to look for that Christian that God has purified, that they see that God has done and changed their life, where they're different from what they were before. That's what they want. There's a man uh, in the church back in Hutchinson. His name is Bobby. He's been coming for some time now. I uh, gave him a track six months ago, and he said, well, you may see me one day. Didn't show up. I never thought another thing about it. It was on a Thursday night, gave him a track, never saw him for four or five months. He showed up in church one day, and he's been coming ever since, and I started to meet with him on Saturdays at home and go through a Bible study, and he, want, he said, you know, I want to be different. And he said, you know, I, I came to church because I knew there was something I did not have. And he got saved later on, and now he's been slowly giving things up. He's been slowly changing some things that he knows has been wrong in his life, as in all glory to the Savior. But it's because Bobby knew that on, set, on a Thursday night when I knocked on his door, I didn't come in sin. Hey, man, I didn't come and, you know, look like the world. I looked like somebody that God had changed, and he wanted what, what God did for me, for himself. That's what God wants for us. God wants us to separate us so that when, we, when, God, when the world sees us, they see God's glory and it allows them to, and it, and it gives them a desire to have what we have. Now, we don't believe in lifestyle evangelism where all you do is win people by your lifestyle. Now, I do believe that some people uh, are, uh, do come to church because of they see you and you invite them and, they, and those things. But soul winning is a conscious effort where we go and knock doors but, and, and that you invite people to church. But the blessing of separation is when you purify yourself and then when you do go give the gospel, God can work even more through you, the Bible says. So we have to know that line of separation. Lots of people are going to heaven. I believe that. Lots of people are saved. But there are lots of Christians that have not begun this purification process in themselves. And God's intention is that they do. Now they're saved and born again and praise the Lord for that. Hell is not their home. But that's not all that God wants from us while we live. God wants us to look different in what we do, what we watch, what we listen to, how we act in this present world so that we can be a light. Amen. God wants us to be careful in all of those things. The Bible talks about three things that affect, uh, that affect us in the world. And we're going to keep real quick. I've got to give you those other notes real quick. So underneath uh, number three, separation from the world. God says, letter A, be not conformed to the world. Three references in Scripture, God talks about the world and the Christian. Number one, or letter, 
Letter A, be not conformed to the world. Romans 12.2. Romans 12.2. And you know what? Let me turn there so I can read that to you. Romans 12.2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conformed means to fashion alike. God says that we are not to fashion ourselves after the world, but we're supposed to fashion ourselves after the Lord Jesus Christ. Fashioning ourselves is, bas or basic, is basically the world should not be a mirror of our lives. When we look at the world, we should not be looking into a mirror. We should be looking at something different because God wants to fashion us in a different manner. That's why, uh, that's why uh, a lot of churches, uh, they have uh, difficulties, have problems with, with uh, uh, some Christians because you can only grow to a certain point and then God will no longer let you grow until you begin to stop fashioning after the world and fashion after the Lord. Uh, number, uh, letter B, be not a friend of the world. James 4.4 4 says this, be not a friend of the world. Of the world. Now again, when we read this, don't misunderstand, God is not saying that you are not to be friendly to the people of the world. We're talking about the world's agenda. James 4.4, 4, Ye adulterers, adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. So God's talking about spiritually here. God calls these Christians adulterers and adulteresses because they are saved, born again, God is their father, and they are friends with the world. And God says that's enmity because the world is anti-God. The agenda the devil's pushing is anti-the Lord. And so if we're not careful as Christians, if we allow ourselves to be friends, then God looks at us and says, what are we doing? God says, the world is against me. Why are we yoked? together unequally. Because like for instance, Jesus called Judas friend. Okay, Judas was not a born again Christian, but Jesus was his friend. God is not saying we are to separate ourselves and not be friendly to people, but when those people do push the agenda on you that the world's trying to push, that's when we draw a line. It's like when I used to work uh, out in, in a secular job, I was friends with my co-workers until they tried to push things on me and then I drew a line and said, I'm sorry, I don't go there. They tried to invite me out to go to parties. They tried to invite me to go to the local bars and things like that. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. And we stopped there because now they're trying to push the agenda of the world. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm your friend, but I don't do that. You can come to me and be a friend. You can come to church with me. We can be great friends. But I'm not going to go do that. Because God says we're not to be a friend of this world. We are to be a friend to those people, but not to their agenda. We are to be kind to those people, but not to what when it compromises Christian principles. Letter C, be not entangled in the world. John chapter 15 verse 19 talks about this. John 15 verse 19. There here. It says, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. The main there is talking about, uh, if it says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the, wor of the world, he says he's chosen us out of the world, therefore the world hates us. And so a lot of times Christians begin to be entangled with the world. And we're going to go to another verse, 2 Peter uh, 2.20. But a lot of times Christians become entangled with the world and get yoked up with the world and don't realize the world that the, agenda, the, world that the devil is pushing hates you as a Christian. The devil's not after you to help you. The devil's after you because he hates you. And so a lot of times we get yoked up and think, wow, these people are my, you know, this, this world, this agenda that they're pushing, these are my friends. And then like the prodigal son, when it comes time that we need help, we're left in the ditch. Because the world hates Christians. 
The devil hates Christians. 2 Peter 2.20 says, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, this is where uh, this point comes in. It says, They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So God says for a Christian, when they escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, when you get saved, you've, been, you've escaped the pollutions of the world. God has given you victory. But then when you are again entangled in the world, you go back to the world. The Bible says your end is worse than when you started. Because the devil now is after you even more. You're no longer his child. You're a child of God. The devil is going to do more to ruin your life to make sure you never go back to God. Your end will be worse than the beginning. That's why it's so important as Christians we keep ourselves separated from the world because we don't want to accidentally entangle ourselves and never come back to the Lord. Now it's possible... But God says the end then will be worse than the beginning. So we must be careful. It says for verse 21, For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. How important God says that, it's, that we stay away from the world, that we stay away from the flesh and the temptations therein. We have to be careful. How do we get entangled in the world? It's, and the devil goes through three things, and we know this, and I just quote him, and we'll be getting out of here quickly. The devil goes through, the Bible says, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Those three things will cause you to be entangled in the world. Let me give you a, a for instance. How many of you have seen, and I know that we all have, when you go driving down Kellogg, there's these huge billboards, and on them pop up pictures. Anybody know what I'm talking about? There's some pretty bad pictures that come on those billboards. I was driving down the other day, and I had to turn. My wife looked at me, and I thought, have mercy. You know what the devil's trying to do? The devil is trying to entangle you through the lust of the eyes. The devil knows what draws our attention. The devil knows what will hook you. And he flashes that on a bright billboard through his agenda, through his philosophy, because he wants to entangle you. Because he knows what you'll think about if you look. The pride of life. The devil will give you opportunities to take advantage of pride through gain, through money, through business, where you'll forsake God because of the pride of life and then the lust of the flesh. The Bible says these three things, if we're not careful, will take us. But like I was talking about, those billboards, we have to be so careful as Christians driving down the road because the devil is constantly going to push things in front of your eyes to cause you to look. The biggest thing that I have seen in this, in this generation, even as a teenager, I don't even think it was this bad. It's, it's come in the last 10 and 15 years. I have seen more of nakedness because the devil, for some reason, there's something about it that has attracted. It's the Sodom and Gomorrah all over again where the devil knows he's attracting people through the lust of the eyes and putting out there in front of you as a Christian that nakedness to draw your attention. And more Christians have fallen because of this one thing. More pastors have fallen because of looking at inappropriate things on the Internet. That's why I'm so careful we have a filter on my computer is called clean internet and it blocks certain websites because more pastors have gone away from God and been entangled in the world because of the nakedness, the agenda the devil's pushing. If you don't believe me, walk outside. I was at Dylan's the other day. My, people dress so terrible now. You know why? Because the agenda the devil's pushing. He puts it on billboards 
And then people of the world, they're lost. They don't know. So then they think, well, that must be what we're supposed to look like. And they come out in public. And then we as Christians, I've done that walking through stores. I, I just put my head down. My wife leads me. People think like I'm blind. They feel bad. They're like, oh. <laughs> and I feel bad. I'm like, no, no, no. I was like, I just can't look up. <laughs> They think, they're like, oh. <laughs> and I'm not trying to be like deceiving, but it's just that I can't, I'm like, oh, well, have mercy. I mean, how would you think about it if you walked up to your pastor and I'm standing there in Walmart looking at all that magazines on the shelf? What would you think of me? You'd be like, uh, this is my pastor. <laughs> But it's just as important for the pastor as it is for the people because we're Christians together. We're brethren. And the devil's not just after me. He's after you. And so we must be so careful because the devil is pushing this agenda. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. You, I, I encourage you, and I feel bad because for those of you that work in secular jobs, I've done it, and it's worse. I get to remain and, and, and work at a church where I can control my environment. You can't. That's tough. And so we must be on guard so much the more carefully because the, because the devil is trying to push as men. And when you go out and you work in the world, the devil is trying to push in front of you the women to draw your attention. It's terrible. Be careful. May I encourage you. As the summer comes on, the tops will get lower and the skirts will get higher. You know why? The devil wants you to go. Because he wants to entangle you. That's why as Christians we must be so careful. Be careful for your family. Be careful for your children. Your children know. Your children see. Watch their eyes. Watch what goes on. They will pick up things faster than you do. And it's important for us that we see what the world is doing and not allow ourselves to mimic that. Don't allow yourself to think because the world does it, it's okay. That's why in the book of Corinthians there was problems. Because the Corinthians were allowing that agenda to be still pushed on them and Paul said, time to separate. Time to separate. Boy, how important it is. Because God has so much in store for you. I pray for you guys and for those of you that work. Because I know it's tough. And the devil's out to get you. I pray for you dearly. Because I love you dearly. And I know the devil is very quick to put things in front of you. Please be careful. Alone allow you, the devil to capture your attention through, those, through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Then letter D and we'll be done. Love not the world. The last command that God gives us, Matthew 6, 24, says, Love not the world, or not Matthew, 1 John, but Matthew 6, 24 is another verse. But 1 John 2, 17 says that uh, to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. God says ultimately what it boils down to for a Christian is this. When we are not willing to separate, it's because we just love the world too much. God says we want to come to a place to where you love Him more than you love this present world. Because if you love the world so much, then the Bible says God's, the love of the Father is not in you. The love for souls, the love for the Bible, the love for the things of God. People wonder, maybe, why don't I love church like I should and love prayer and Bible reading? You know why? You're in love with this world too much. That's when the word separate means to sever. That's when you begin to just start cutting things off. When you say, you know, God, I'm so sorry. Have any of you been there where you just know something has been taking the place of God in your life and you say, God, I'm so sorry. I'm just going to get rid of it. I've done that. Had some things where I just, I was praying one day and God said, you know what? That's not right. And I said, God, I'm sorry. I just threw it away. I severed it right there. Because I don't want anything between me and God. 
I want to maintain that relationship with the Lord. And I believe we all do. And like I said, this is an ongoing process. We must all consistently and be growing to try to know what can we do to draw closer to the Lord. If you want to love God more, then we must love the world less. And boy, it's tough. Because again, you deal with flesh. You're going to fail. We all do. I've done it. And so we have to come to that point where we just pick ourselves back up, dust ourselves off and say, you know what? Let's try it again. Get back up and serve God. We've fallen. We say, man, Lord, I came back to what I loved, I guess. You dust yourself off and say, God, I'm going to try it again. You get back in the Word of God. You get back in prayer. You get back into church. And you watch, God will do something. Boy, God can work. Amen. We just have to give God that chance. Amen. Through the Word of God, through prayer, and through the local church. And encourage each other. Encouraging each other to stay faithful. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure do.